I want to introduce him, come up to the stage and tell us all about the technological strategy and how you will bring uh, Picnic into the world of open source. Cool. Thanks yeah. a lot for the introduction. You're welcome. Right. Let's see if we can get the uh, starting off. screen uh, live. Good morning, everybody. It's quite exciting to be uh, at a little bit more technical crowd. I'm giving uh, more often a talk about Picnic and uh, kind of the Picnic startup story. But uh, usually there is a little bit more the kind of the business crowd. So I'm pretty excited to uh, talk to you about uh, more the technical side of the business. So maybe before I go into the subject matter, can I see a show of hands? Who of you guys actually has heard about Picnic? Yes, that looks good. Uh, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Uh, who actually has downloaded the app? Okay, a few. Uh, who has actually tried it? Who has placed an order? Who is super happy? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we'll see how we, uh, how we handle this. Great. Okay, good. Um, my name is Daniel, CTO of Picnic, and we have a very simple mission. What we want to do is to make grocery shopping, especially online grocery shopping, simple, fun, and affordable. Sounds simple? It's not. So the way as we started is with a very simple question. The very simple question is, why is actually nobody shopping for food online while everybody is shopping for non-food items like electronics, like books, like fashion online? So everybody of us is buying books. Usually 50, 60% of the retail for books is online. For electronics, it's even more. For fashion, it's 30%. But if you look to food, then just 1% or 2% of a pretty big market is online. So everybody, when we thought about this, everybody was saying, well, this is not an interesting market. Why do you look into this? Because there's just a very small part online. But from 1% or 2% online, what we saw is an opportunity to move 98% of the market into the online world. But the question that we asked is why is nobody shopping online? And we identified three main reasons. First one is it has been pretty expensive. And expensive means you had to pay for delivery fees. You had higher prices online. You had all kinds of hidden costs. Nobody likes this. Have you seen this earlier? We have. In fashion, we have seen the same trend until 2005. You had to pay for the delivery. You had to pay for the return. Nobody was doing fashion online. Then Zalando and Zappos and other companies came and said, well, we just make it for free. We just improve our business, we improve our logistics, and then we actually deliver for free. And that broke up the entire fashion industry. And we thought, well, we can do something similar also for food. But there's more. And the second one is nobody wants to wait. If you order something, if you order books or if you order uh, electronics, then it's okay if somebody tells you, well, we deliver in the morning or in the afternoon. But if you order for food, it's not good enough if somebody tells you, we deliver between uh, four and eight. Because maybe you can use the food for dinner or not. So this is just not good enough. And the third reason is shopping has been pretty cumbersome. And cumbersome means in the way as the kind of the shopping interfaces have been designed is in a way as you do shopping for two or three items, what you do for electronics and for books. You buy an iPad and an iPad charger, or you buy a, a few trousers, and then you just return, you buy five trousers, you return four, and you take one. But if you buy food, you buy actually 30 products, 40 products. That's a complete different ballgame. So these three things led to a pretty simple situation. Just one and a half percent in Netherlands has been of the food business has been online. So $40 billion industry, 1.5% online. And we thought there is an opportunity, and we went into this. So the first one is we wanted to understand why is, actually, why is this industry kind of so traditional. Nobody has actually cracked the codes there. And we thought, well, let's look to the, uh, the way as actually the supermarket business is organized. And what you see here is on the left-hand side, you see the food producers. And then you see actually a warehouse. And then you see the supermarkets, and you as a customer went to the supermarket. That's a pretty traditional way of organizing a supermarket business. And that is something what is traditional since the uh, 1950s. And everybody has been doing it exactly in the same way. And what most companies have been doing, they did something pretty simple. They just replaced the route that you have been doing 
towards the supermarket by route from himself. So say it delivered from the supermarket to your home. But obviously, if you are extending the supply chain, somebody needs to pay for this. And that led to the situations that you pay typically between 4 and 15 euros for deliveries of food. Not very attractive. So we thought, well, there is something that needs to be a better way. And the better way means we need to go back on actually trying to understand how to improve the business here. And we remembered a quote from Alan Kay. And the quote from Alan Kay uh, simply reads, if you want to be really successful in software, then you actually need to also be the owner of the hardware side. And that is something what a company like Apple, for instance, has been in the most, let's say, pure way actually realized. If you buy Apple hardware, you have Apple software and the other way around. If you don't do this, you end up in the world where Microsoft has been uh, for the last uh, 15, 20 years. And we thought that is something, there is also something to be learned from this. And our principle is pretty simple. If you want to be successful in e-commerce, then you actually need to own the supply chain. You need to own the logistics. That's a pretty bold uh, proposition. And this is a bold proposition for one simple reason. Building up an online site, maybe with Drupal and a couple of other online services, is pretty easy if you have a funding of a couple of hundred K, and then you have a bit of pizza and a bit of coffee, and then you can hack this together in just a couple of weeks. But this is not possible if you own physical hazards. So this is something, this has been a route which is not simple. And then we actually remembered another very traditional uh, principle. And the traditional principle is something what we call the milkman. The milkman is a guy who actually brought the groceries in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s to all kinds of uh, locations. And what he did is he went a kind of a route. He didn't go, he, he, didn't, he didn't offer, uh, he just went ev to every city or every village just once per day or, once, uh, or twice or three times per week. And he had a great service and people loved it. It was no longer profitable at the point when supermarkets started, but this principle is something which actually we thought we can reinvent. We can actually bring to 2017 or 2018. And our principle is quite simple. Take out the supermarkets, deliver directly from a warehouse, and organize a distribution system in the same way as the milkman was organizing its round. What a normal distribution system is doing is actually delivering groceries uh, at any arbitrary time in the day to you. So what happens in practice is you order something in the eastern part of the city at 10, at 10 o'clock and somebody in the western part uh, is, uh, is making an order at 10.10 and 10.30 is somebody in the south and 10.40 in the north. What you get is that your distribution system or the, your drivers are going crisscross through a city extremely inefficient. You never get this profitable. What we thought is, we can do this better. We say we just go with a round, like the old milkman, see each customer just once per day, not 10 times, not 20 times, but then actually give back the prof uh, what we gain from this to the customer. And this is actually what we did uh, with Picnic. So the proposition was pretty simple. We said, well, all groceries at lowest price guarantee, free delivered, to the doorstep of the customer. And if he likes, even uh, actually up to the kitchen. There's another kind of important uh, proposition that we uh, came up with, is we just don't do any web. We just do mobile. That has been a pretty bold uh, proposition, because the kind, of, uh, the kind of market that we are tackling is a pretty traditional market. So we are actually tackling people, or we are approaching people that have not done online or e-commerce shopping before. So they are doing the first time some online shopping that have, in most cases, uh, just, a, um, uh, just a, a laptop and are used to this laptop. So that has been a kind of a bit of a bold uh, shot. It works out pretty well now. Nonetheless, the first step is something, is something completely non-software related. If you go from zero to one, if you actually want to start your business, you need to do something very physical. And physical means you have to build up your hardware. And hardware means not just some servers. These days, if you think about servers, it's just, let's say, the EC2 instances that you rent somewhere. But if we are talking about hardware, it means building an actual warehouse. So let's have a look how this looks. <laughs>
So that's what, what we did uh, in uh, six weeks, building a warehouse where everybody was uh, talking, well, telling us that you need six months for this. But the next step is that you simply say, well, you go live. And going live means just announcing that you do something. And doing something means we just made a small press release that, well, in the small city of Amersfoort, we will offer our service. And then the following thing happened. People just liked the service. People just downloaded the service. In the first day, we had, um, oh, almost for this by the way, here. Um, um, we just had a couple of people that have been seriously interested, up to the point that we have subscriptions from the islands. Where we are, by the way, not uh, for now. Not sure if we ever will be there. But anyway, um, the really interesting part is what we saw there, there is not only an opportunity, there is actual demand. And if you have demand, then actually you just you have a business. And now I will talk a bit on how we build it up. But before I do this, let me show you how a consumer actually perceives the service, and then we go into details. So thus, this was the point when we had actually the service available. In Amersfoort, where we had four cars and 100,000 people interested. That led this, to the situation uh, that we heard earlier, that we actually needed to organize a little bit the way as people are entering the service. Because if you have 100,000 orders for a day, and you have just four cars, then you have a serious challenge. So let's see a bit uh, which kind of real technical challenges uh, we were tackling uh, on the way. The real technical challenges are something where I go one step back. And one step back means, if you think about a supermarket, you wouldn't think about it very much that there's a lot of tech involved. But there's one really important thing, and this is a quote from Roy Amara, and that led to the Gartner uh, actually hyper cycle, which says that actually technology is usually on the short term pretty much overestimated, but on the long term, underestimated. And the reason why this is important is said, let's say the evaluation of investments is usually on the short term, uh, let's say, returns. But on the long term, you will nearly always with technology investments benefit from what you have done. So therefore, we thought early on, that is something what we need to build up like a tech company. But there's more to this. What this means in reverse is, because it is just a long term return uh, business, you actually need to invest early if you want to have, at, some, at a reasonable point in time, some outcome. So, first challenge that we actually tackled is something what we call the so-called grocery challenge uh, or the shopping challenge um, problem. And what we want to do is, nobody likes actually shopping for groceries. You like to buy a tenderloin steak, but nobody loves to shop for their toothpaste or for their uh, pampers, or for their uh, toilet paper. So what we want to do is actually make it as simple as possible for customers to shop for those kind of, let's say, regular repetitive items. The idea that we have is to make it possible that customers can shop in 30 minutes for all their articles, uh, in three minutes for all their articles. That's a pretty bold statement, because if you look to a typical shopping cycle in Cool Blue or Wacom, that takes easily 20, 30 minutes. 
So the solution for us is that we go a step further with recommendations and what we call, the, uh, what we, and we call this bulk recommendations. If you go to a site like Amazon, then typically you see one by one a kind of products recommended. And this is not good enough if you want to actually shop for 20, 30, 40 articles. Because then you still need to actually go to the 30 or 40 recommended articles. What we are looking for is for recommendation of an entire set of items. And those kind of items should cover kind of the more repetitive and more kind of boring items. But such a feature you can only expose if you have actually 80 or 90% uh, precision in, uh, for your customers. Because otherwise, you show too often items that customers don't like. And if for a small device, it's a big problem. Because obviously, uh, you have a very small uh, real estate. So what are the challenges there? Well, the challenges, the challenges are actually that the precision that you need for such a recommender system needs to be much, much higher. If you have a uh, precision of a single item of 90% likelihood, then for 12 items in total, it is less than 30%. So if you get, go in reverse, then you actually need to have a recommender system which is an order of magnitude more accurate to make a likelihood of 90% uh, for your products. So that has been a, a pretty serious challenge. And then you have the typical kind of causeries challenges that you have seasonality effects and other kind of effects that you need to take into account. Let me show you a bit of how this looks like. I don't have too many formulas, but this is a kind of a funny formula that I wanted to show you with you guys. So uh, recommendation means simply, well, what is the likelihood that the next time you buy some milk based on your shopping history? And shopping history means, well, four days ago you have bought some uh, Nutella, seven days ago you have bought some Tony Chocolonis, and nine days ago you have bought some um, Olives. And what you do then is actually you build a kind of a hackathon. I think everybody of you guys has been probably in a hackathon. What, um, what do you like to do? You play with, play with new technologies. And what we wanted to do is, well, just build a neural network, a kind of a deep learning network, like uh, most of you have maybe experimented a bit with it. Our one looks like this. Looks a bit scary, but in the end, uh, it's pretty simple to understand. So what you have on the left-hand side, well, you put in the shopping history of customer. So what did you buy a week or two weeks ago? How many bananas, uh, uh, red wine, and some Nutellas? And then you look on the right-hand side, what, uh, what is he actually most likely to buy as a next, uh, next product? That's not your heart. But the real insight and the real problem with this approach is that it's not good. It's simply not good enough. So the likelihood is 50%. So that means if you take this kind of recommendation for half of your customers, you show wrong products. The reason for this is pretty simple. You need the amount of data that you need for a deep learning network to really work properly is you need to work on the scale of Amazon or, let's say, a very large retailer. For us, as a kind of a, in the beginning, as a kind of a local retailer, where we are in a couple of dozen cities with just around 100,000 customers, was not good enough. So what we thought is, well, we need to go back. So what you can do is there is you can, of course, build a kind of a training, uh, let's say, training uh, sample set, etc. But we went a slightly different route. And we went a route which is, I think, something which everybody of you has done also sometimes, but uh, it needs a little bit of guts. And that means don't take the latest technology, but go a step back and use something which has worked already 50 years back. And what we did is we used a model which is called RFM. This is Recency Frequency Monetary. It's a model how in a supermarket people have since 50 years actually built recommendations and uh, kind of advertisement of products. And the model is super simple, so let me just talk you through how this works. What you do is, you take per customer, what has he bought for the last uh, 10 times? Number one, pretty simple. Next one, what are the top items? What did he buy uh, most often? Next one, well, you rank it by frequency, you filter out the stuff that he uh, is currently not available due to seasonality, and then you just display this. Super simple, you can explain it to your uh, four-year-old daughter. Everybody understands it. The really interesting part is, this works absolutely like a charm. And what we then did is, and this is the really interesting part, is we combined this old model with the deep learning model, and we got to a pretty interesting uh, insight. And this is something what I want to share with you. So what you see here is now uh, is the number of orders, and uh, you see the likelihood um, that actually recommendations are proper. And what you see is, if you don't have enough orders, the likelihood is not, not too good. And the reason for this is, this is a so-called big data problem. 
a lot of customers have this kind of short shopping history, but actually the shopping history is too short. If you buy just a few, a few times with, uh, with a retailer, then you don't know enough about a customer, so you will not be very good in recommending. The other problem is on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side is actually if you have uh, customers that bought a lot of times with you, you can probably predict better, but you don't have too many, so therefore you also can't predict well. The sweet spot is in between, where you have big and deep data. So that is a pretty interesting uh, kind of insight that we got there. Are you ready for some uh, actual uh, uh, kind of class, uh, business case? So one of the business cases is, well, if you buy a raw de curry, then the likelihood that you buy also cocos milk uh, in your basket is uh, 20 times higher. A pretty uh, clear and obvious case, because that is something what you can put together in a meal. But it gets even better. If you say, well, if you buy some bio cleaner, the likelihood that you buy also bio bananas is actually 10 times higher. So there's a kind of a basic preference that you see across the kind of the products that uh, customers are buying. And the third one is if you buy Pembers, so that means, uh, let's say, in, in your family situ situation, you're caring about also the next generation, etc., then you also buy kind of bulk milk from uh, bio cows, uh, cows and, uh, well, kind of uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable products. This is pretty obvious if you see it now and if you hear the explanation. But this is something what for retailers has been not so obvious. And that is something what, uh, what is pretty interesting to get from the data. Okay, second challenge. Second challenge is something what we call, um, and that is a part of the co-creation, is something what we call the co-creation challenge. We started in the business by understanding how to do e-commerce. But we had very little understanding about food and very little understanding about uh, logistics. So what? should we do here? Well, the approach is pretty simple. You say, you take a kind of a baseline, the kind of the product that every customer is offering, and then you just ask your customers, what else would you like to have in your shop? A little bit like uh, what you do with kind of uh, co-creating products together with your customers. So what we now have is that every single week, we have lots of suggestions that are coming in for products and for a kind of uh, additional categories, etc. In the beginning, we had a pretty simple approach how we handled this. What we did is we just made it visible, so that means you put it in a kind of a spreadsheet, you put it in a Slack message, and then you just uh, go one by one over this. Works pretty well in the beginning if you have just a couple of dozen feedback items. But at some point, if you have thousands of items, you have a team of 20, 30, 40, 50 people that are just doing this kind of uh, assortment suggestions. Doesn't scale. So we needed to get better. And getting better means in this case, you need to apply some actual, actual and natural language processing. So our pipeline looks now like as follows. If you actually have in the, uh, if you miss a product, so that means you are in a category, you don't find what you are looking for, then the next step is that we store this on our side and then we put it in Azure ML. And what we do there is a pretty simple system. What we do is we take all the suggestions from the past we link it to the actual categories and to the products that have been meant. And then if a new suggestion comes in, we try to identify what is the possible product <coughs> that a customer meant. So this is something which is actually working pretty well. So, and then, uh, then, uh, then uh, the next step is that we have also sent this as a kind of a communication system. So this is a system where we can, in many, many cases now, actually relate when you are asking for a new product, which product is meant. The system itself is just learning from past requests and has no understanding of the actual specifics of the language, if it's Dutch or English or any other language. So what we now see is, I don't know if you can read the numbers here, but um, for the category which we call Vorratkast, so kind of the cupboard uh, typical uh, categories, there we have an accuracy of identifying if you ask for a new product uh, with 90% which product you, are, you mean. And why do, we know the, uh, why, do we, why do we have this high accuracy? Because people are asking so many times for the same product, never in the same way, but the kind of the variations are kind of limited. So therefore, if, you, if 10 times somebody has asked for organic peanut butter, the 11th time will be a different variation. It will be never exactly the same like the first 10, but it is similar enough that we can actually automatically categorize it. But you have other cases. You have the case, for instance, like animal food, um, where you actually don't have sufficient amount of data. 
Animal food means um, you have a pretty small assortment. And if people are asking, or if customers are asking, for actual changes in the assortment or additional assortment, then uh, you have such a wide variety that, um, uh, that uh, the kind of the automatic classification doesn't work well enough. Our learning from this is pretty simple. Our learning is before you enter in the space of AI systems, you need to do your AI, uh, data science. And what I mean by this is that the kind of the data science, kind of Excel spreadsheet-based analysis of data, you need to first understand which kind of part of your tech stack you can actually, you, uh, where you can actually use some deep learning and machine learning before you actually move into this. We have other areas where it didn't work at all, and that's the reason why this is an important one. Third one. Third one is what we call the distribution challenge. Distribution means actually bringing the goods to customers. And to customers means that we have our own fleet that we bring with our own drivers to customers. And we have a pretty narrow uh, delivery window. So the delivery window itself is just 20 minutes. And we want to deliver a de facto all deliveries in the window. And the remaining ones, well, let's say the remaining 1% deliver in the kind of the original one hour window. The lucky part or the good part for us is that we have actually a pretty low uh, no-show rate. If you look to a normal postal service, a normal postal service has to fight with kind of no-show rates, meaning no, the customer is not at home, of something like 10, 15, 20%. Not very nice. But for food, it's much easier. Because if you're not at home, you don't have food tonight. So that motivates people to actually be at home in time. So let me, let me show you a bit how a typical delivery day looks on our site. doesn't render so well uh, on, on the big screen. So what you see here is, is that actually we are going in three shifts in the kind of different parts of the city. Um, the really important part is that actually, and I want to show you a little bit on how we optimize our logistics. The reason why we are optimizing for drop times, so you have two parameters for logistics. How fast can you go from your hub, let's say from the per point you start, to your customers? and from customer one to customer two, and customer two to customer three, and how much time do we spend per customer? What everybody is optimizing in logistics is that you can go very fast to the first customer, that you can go very fast from the first to the second customer. But this is only an optimization eh? because nobody has sufficient density. In our case, because we are bringing kind of, uh, f because we are in the food business and we are doing grocery deliveries, for us, the point is a completely different game. For us, it doesn't matter how fast you are from customer one to customer two and customer two to customer three, because it's anyway just a couple of dozen meters. So you can do this easily in just 20, 30 seconds. The important part is how much time do you spend for a customer. And at a customer, what you need to do is you need to find a parking spot, you need to actually unload the vehicle, you need to find the door of the customer, you need to uh, ring the bell, the customer needs to go there, you need to give him the products, you take the Stasi-Geld and uh, empty bottles and whatever back, and then you need to go back uh, to your car. It takes much longer than actually going to the next customer, which is anyway just uh, two, uh, two uh, houses further. So therefore, the really interesting part, uh, what we are doing, which is completely different to the remaining or the rest of the logistics world is, be optimized for drop times. And drop times means for us, we want to understand how long does it take for a customer to deliver to a customer. So first one is we have error constant, which means how easy is it to find actually a parking spot at the customer. But there's more. The next one is, um, is it a first-time customer? And a first-time customer means the customer has typically some questions. He has typically uh, maybe something that he wants to get explained in the app or that there's something what he wants to actually ask the, the runner or that he wants to actually, uh, let's say, provide as feedback. So therefore, we just have a constant where we say, for a first-time delivery, we take a little bit of more time. But there's more. The next one is, well, of course, the number of products that you deliver. So this is something which we call the MPM products. 
and the chilled products. So these are kind of a frozen pizza or kind of a banana or kind of a fruit, etc., in kind of different temperature zones. But the real magic of such a system is in the last component. The last component is something what we call here T-delta. And the T-delta contains a lot of different factors that make logistics either smart or dumb. What it means for us is we need to understand what is the difference between a daytime and night delivery. At the daytime, it is roughly 23 seconds easier or faster to find a parking spot and to find a way to the customer. But there's more. If you actually, if you understand where is the location of the, uh, of the door, for instance, front door or back door, it takes an average 23 seconds uh, uh, more if you go to the back door of a customer. If you go to the second floor, it takes uh, roughly uh, 20 seconds longer. And many, many more factors. Funny fact, if you go to the third floor instead of second floor, no difference. Nobody knows exactly why, but it's just a matter of uh, this effect that we sell. So this kind of logistics optimizations, this kind of logistics insight, you need to put in a kind of a model, you make recursion, and every day you optimize the model. So from a customer, it looks like as follows. As a customer, you're selecting now, let's say, a delivery for tomorrow. And what you see here on top, you see between 6.15 or 18.15 and 19.15, you get uh, your groceries delivered. It's a pretty simple uh, and a pretty straightforward way of organizing it. So next one is, well, we are now making in the night our planning, and then you see, well, at the next day, well, you see already between 18.15 and 19.10, so this is the 20-minute window uh, that I was talking about earlier. So this is the 20-minute window that we uh, deliver to the customers. But the real interesting part starts now. What we now do is, now we actually give a customer the notification. We are on our way. And why do we do this? Because we actually want to make this an experience to gather with our customers. This is a kind of a co-creation of the entire delivery experience. And co-creation means that you actually show to your customer where you are in real time. That looks like uh, as follows. So now we know in the app, we show to a customer that Marco is on its way. He's five minutes away. He just needs to take a, lot, a few more uh, turns until he is at the address of Bomberg 4. And when he's here, the customer will actually not even, not just knows that he's there, but usually many customers are opening the door, helping to unload the vehicle, and many more things. So you make it an experience together with your customers, not just for your customer. So this is something, this is a feature that actually half of the customers are always opening. So they just want to know when we are there. And that is something which, uh, which really helped us to, uh, to optimize uh, further our, uh, our logistics. Last one is kind of last challenge. It comes from, from, uh, from our, um, our work on the interfaces. We thought, well, we can't do web, because that is something which is very much 2010. So we started with mobile. However, we, went, we wanted to go a step further. And step further means, what comes after web? Nobody knows exactly. People are talking about AR, VR, and many, many more things. But one thing what we know is, said there is most likely a change in interfaces. And we experimented a bit with Alexa and with uh, Google Home, meaning that you have an interface where you don't need any longer to open the app to actually add a product to your basket. So the idea is, whenever you run low on products, low on milk, no on uh, any kind of food, that you just say, stay in your kitchen, that you say, at the next delivery, I want to have this product. So let's have, a next, uh, let's have a look at how this looks in a practice with Alexa. Okay, I'm going to briefly show you what our prototype for the picnic skill does. And we're going to add some groceries to our basket. For example, Alexa, ask picnic to add banana. Okay, I have added banana to your picnic basket. And then we go check on our basket and the banana is there. We can also say, Alexa, ask Picnic to add coffee. Okay, I have added coffee to your picnic basket. And it is also there. So we can ask, Alexa, ask Picnic what's in my cart. Currently, your cart has two articles worth 9.38 euros. 
Okay, and then we also introduced some speech counts, which are the phrases that Alexa say more expressively. So, for example, Alexa, ask picnic to add broccoli. Yuck! I mean, I have added broccoli to your picnic basket. And then we can just add, ask more, one more time, Alexa, ask picnic what's in my cart. Currently, your cart has three articles worth 11.13 euros. Okay, uh, this is uh, the demo. Uh, we will submit this skill for certification later this year, so all of our customers can have it available. Good. Um, um, so just at a dinner with uh, Werner a couple of um, a couple of weeks back, um, um, well, the skills uh, submitted to Amazon uh, to Alexa, but. Uh, Currently, Alexa is not in the Netherlands, but it's in Germany, so that's at least a, a kind of a first step. I promised you also to talk a little bit about the open source part, and I didn't do too much about this. I just talked about co-creation, how we have built together with customers our shop and our kind of delivery experience. But the real question that we asked at some, let's say, not too far, not too far back from now, is can we, can we really build the entire service on ourselves? The real question here is, we have used quite a bit of open source. So we have used uh, stuff from Google, we have stuff from Netflix, we have used, uh, of course, uh, Lucene, etc. So therefore, the question is, if we actually use these kind of services, maybe it's also time to actually give back to the community. And we started something, what we call Tech for Life, as an initiative where we actually open source parts of our stack. We need to see a bit on how we organize this and how fast we can uh, open source this more and more. But the real idea is that the real, let's say, intellectual property, and that is something what you probably also see on, uh, in, in your systems and on, in your part, is usually more on the data side than on the actual code that you develop. So therefore, there's no need to stay kind of closed source for the code that you develop. You can easily open source this. So what we open source now are kind of four, four libraries, and it's just a kind of the beginning. So we started with something which is more on the DevOps side about ping and probes. The next one was a kind of a small library for Android where you can easily uh, also mark kind of a product, mark an area of a picture as a kind of a specific part and then uh, have a kind of send this back to, uh, to, to Android. The way as we use this is, if a customer sees a broken product, then he can make a picture and can simply mark the area where the broken product is. The first, uh, third part is uh, something what we call the API bot. So this is kind of a test library, how you can build integration tests. Uh, we didn't see a kind of a very good uh, solution for this now in the market. And the fourth one is uh, something what we call a kind of reactive support. So everybody loves reactive programming, but still, this is a kind of a paradigm which is in a pretty early stage. So therefore, we are contributing to the community to make it easier to work uh, on the reactive side. I want to close the talk with a bit of learnings that we saw and that we got from uh, this kind of journey. And the learnings are mainly around four or five points that are really important that I want to share with you. So the first one is, well, if you get started, you need to have a kind of a big dream. You need to aim for something very significant. However, nobody really got something big done by not starting small. So this is a very, very crucial thing. Everybody knows it. Most people don't apply it. That's a big thing. What we started off is we had to build a kind of a tech stack where our uh, technical partners uh, told us, well, you need at least a team of 50 people, but we had just five. So they told us, well, you need to build a warehouse. It takes six months, but we had just six weeks. So therefore, act small and try to get some quickly done. Second one is, before you actually um, ask for more data and for more precise data, you need to have a mission that guides you in everything what you're doing. And the reason why this is important is, you will never have enough data. Even Amazon is guided to a large extent by the mission that they have towards their customers. So mission plus data is the kind of the secret source. Third one is, before you go into the kind of world of AI, make your data science homework. Fourth one is, uh, doesn't matter exactly when you start, but you need to launch before you look uh, talk about uh, scaling. 
And it doesn't matter if you launch a kind of a non-scalable solution, everybody has done this. But not launching is not the option. And that is the kind of the most important learning. And the fifth one, everybody claims or complains about not having enough developers. I would have loved more, and everybody would like to have more developers in their teams. But there is, in the restriction of having not enough resources, not enough developers, is also a big advantage. Because it makes you just more focused. And really successful products come from small teams. That brings me to the end of the talk. Thanks a lot for your attention. Daniel, uh, thank you. Uh, you can sit down. Uh. Okay, well, that was the first session of today. Daniel, thanks. Um, and we are going to do a small Q&A, <laughs> after which we can uh, move to our other uh, session of rooms. I'll sit down as well. Uh, well, I prepared uh, a few questions at first. Um, well, the first thing that popped up uh, with us, uh, with Carola and me, uh, at least, at the, at the front row, Mm -hmm. was, uh, why not web? That is because we have this uh, progressive yep. web app uh, systems that come available now and uh, yep. get supported more and more. Um, what's the reason for this? Yeah. It started pretty simple. In the beginning, we had not enough developers, which meant we, it was clear we cannot focus, we cannot build both. We cannot build a mobile app and a web app. So we need to make a decision, do we build just a web app and later a mobile, or just a mobile, and then decide which kind of web strategy we want to take. So we decided at this point in time that we started with mobile, which luckily also worked out pretty well. But obviously, with progressive web, there is now also an alternative for kind of a reasonable web application, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you all have, if you, if you have questions, uh, Carola will uh, be uh, available with a microphone. Um, one year ago, uh, Daniel, uh, at the uh, seminar, you uh, said that Picnic is uh, built around technology that is available uh, now, at this moment. Yep. Uh, what technology in the future do, th do you think that will be vital to your company in five years, ten years? Well, in, in the world of startups or scale-ups, usually you don't think in uh, terms of five years, seven years, or ten years, because you need to make sure that you survive the next year. But the really interesting part is that we are building around a technology stack that we believe has also a sufficient future potential. So we pretty early on invested in all kind of IoT, techno, IoT parts, all kind of AI and deep learning um, uh, modules. And uh, the third part is also already now in kind of uh, autonomous driving and drones. So, what, so one of the really interesting parts is in Europe, uh, autonomous driving is not very far, and it's unlikely to, uh, to happen soon on the public streets. But the interesting part is it is possible on your own ground. So if you look into logistics, then in logistics, a lot of driving is done on the own ground just in the, kind of, uh, in the way as you do a kind of reparking and loading and unloading, etc. So this is parts that in a, in a shelf location, in a retail store. 